Cholesterol. So how do we treat it this year, right now, modern day cholesterol treatments? We're not going to talk about all the stuff from the 1970s and 80s. We're going to talk about modern day treatment. What medications do you start? What are their side effects? What order do you start them in? How to get them approved if they're difficult to be approved? And then some of the side effects and what to do about them and how to change medications or what you can do next and how to get some of them prior off prior authorization so that your patients can be on them and about how much every one of these medications lowers your cholesterol. So if you don't know me, I'm Dr. Allo. I'm a double board certified cardiologist. I've been teaching and treating cholesterol for a very, very long time. Some of you don't know, but cardiologists are generally the people on the front lines of cholesterol treatment. So modern day cholesterol treatment usually starts out with statin medications now if you're like oh my god you're gonna put people on medication no go back and watch my videos on non-pharmacological ways to treat cholesterol i have a number of videos on that there's one of them actually called 11 ways to lower your cholesterol naturally start there let's say the patient did all 11 12 there's actually like 12 of those different ways to lower cholesterol naturally it's still not low enough and they still need their cholesterol lowered. Now we can get into the pharmacotherapeutics. And again, I'll reiterate, the new targets to treat ever since 2018 guidelines have come out. All comers, it's 100. Your LDL cholesterol needs to be under 100. Number, The next number is 70. If somebody has a risk factor, they need to be under 70. If they've had a stent, heart attack, stroke, what have you, they've already had a cardiovascular event, they need to be under 55. If they continue to have cardiovascular events, they had another stroke, had more stents, et cetera, they need to be under 40. Now, the question becomes, what lab work should I order? That's a really good place to start, actually. So first and foremost, we need a fasting lipid panel. The fasting part is not as important, but mainly so we can get a fasting triglycerides. When triglycerides are above about 150, 200, the LDL calculations are still okay, um, but LDL is generally calculated. So in that case, we could use the non-HDL instead. The other thing, you need a fasting lipid panel. You need a apolipoprotein B, sometimes shortened to ApoB. ApoB is a particle count for particle uh, concentration of low-density lipoproteins. I have a whole entire video on that, the difference between LDL cholesterol and lipo, apolipo B, apolipoprotein B. And then the last thing we need is something called a lipoprotein A. A lipoprotein A is a very atherogenic type of uh, lipoprotein. It's a special kind of LDL particle that is three to six times more atherogenic. These are like your patients who are 40, 50, even 30 years old who have new aortic stenosis and or new heart attacks and stents. They don't have any of the usual traditional risk factors. You have to screen for lipoprotein A in these patients. So let's say you got all that. Now, I will say that lipoprotein A, there are no ways to really lower that right now. There are four medications in the work, which we're not going to get into in this lecture. So let's say they've tried every way to get their cholesterol down, but have not been able to. Your LDL cholesterol target is less than 100 for all comers. So what do you do? What is your first line of therapy? The first thing you should do is start a statin medications. Now, statins have been maligned. Literally everybody on social media thinks they're a statin expert. They go on Google and they type in, can I, what, what is the side effects of statins? Uh, you know, what are the dangers of statins? Look, everything has side effects. So does Tylenol. So does too much water too quickly. So does pretty much everything, right? But the question is, we'll get to side effects later, but the question is, what is the risk to reward benefit? And this should be a shared decision-making between you and the patient. So first you wanna start with statins. I generally don't start with the older statins. Those are like Simvastatin, Lovastatin, Pravastatin. Those are the more natural statins. They're not synthetic or semi-synthetic. They have a lot more side effects, especially Simvastatin. A lot of you who are growing up today don't know this, but Simvastatin used to come in an 80 milligram dose, the reason it does not anymore is it had way too many interactions, way too many myalgias, which are muscle aches and muscle soreness. So I usually start with Crestor. It is the most potent statin. Um, usually you could start with five milligrams if you just want like a 25 to 35% reduction. You can go all the way up to 40 if you need like a 55, maybe 65% reduction and all the doses in between. You usually pick a dose and start there. Now, I usually combine it with Zetia. We'll get into Zetia later. Statins block something called HMG-CoA reductase. It is a cholesterol synthesis uh, step. It blocks cholesterol synthesis in almost all of your cells. Um, cholesterol is made by every cell in your body, so you are not uh, you know, overly depleting it. You're not going to have a lack of testosterone. You're not going to have like 
hormone issues, brain issues, all that. The cholesterol in your brain is unaffected by circulating lipoproteins. So let's not mix those things up. Your brain makes its own cholesterol. It actually has a half-life of five years. So a lot of the cholesterol in your brain today, depending on how old you are, may have been there since you were born. Now, all that aside, the, the statins that I use would usually be Crestor first, then Atorvastatin. Atorvastatin is the second most potent. Some people say it's in a tie with Pitavastatin, but Pitavastatin or Livalo, it is actually, it has my name in it, Live Allo. I don't recommend it though because it's not generic yet. It's still expensive and it's hard to get. Levalo at every dose, one, two, and four, is considered a pretty in, you know high intensity statin. Um, whereas Crestor at five and Atorvastatin at 10 usually are considered low, low intensity. As you get higher and higher, the dose becomes high intensity. Atorvastatin is the usual 10, 20, 40, 80. I, like I said, usually start with Crestor and add Zetia. Let's talk about Zetia. Zetia comes in only one dose. It is a cholesterol absorption blocker. It blocks the MPC-like um, sort of transporter in your intestines. It makes you poop out more cholesterol. That's literally how it works. So when you combine uh, statin with Zetia, you end up blocking synthesis and absorption. Now make no mistake, most of the cholesterol that ends up in your intestines ultimately does come from your body, all the cells in your body make cholesterol, they get transported to the liver, which ultimately ends up in your bile, uh, and then into your intestines, and then most of it kind of gets reabsorbed, depending on the person. Some people are hyperabsorbers, some people are hypersynthesizers, most people fall somewhere in between. While Zetia mostly blocks absorption, it still lowers synthesis a little, and while statins mostly block synthesis, they do lower absorption a little. There's a little bit of a crossover. Those are where you want to start, because those are generic, they're cheap, the, you don't need any prior authorization to get them approved. Literally every single patient in the world that needs lipid lowering should probably start it on a combination of both. Now, if you've got a healthy 20-year-old with an LDL cholesterol of 110, 120, they've tried everything in the world to get their lipids down and just couldn't, that's a person that you could just put on Crestor 5 and call it a day. When they're in the 140s and 150s, though, on their LDL, we're only talking LDL here. There's no target to treat any other number. So you don't need to treat their total cholesterol. You don't need to talk about HDL or, you know, triglycerides is a different story, but generally there's no targets to treat triglycerides. But if they were only talking LDL, if they're in the 140s and 150s, that's somebody you want to start on five, maybe 10 of Crestor and add Zetia 10. That should give you probably a 45, you know, maybe 40 to 55 even percent reduction in their LDL cholesterol. That's how you want to do it. If you have people that you want to get down into the 40s and 50s because they've had multiple strokes and heart attacks, obviously, please send them to a cardiologist. We know what to do. So that's where you start. You start with the statin medication plus Zetia. The next line, let's say you've had somebody with multiple stents, had a stroke, had more stents, open, open heart surgery a few years later. What do you do with that person? That person, you want to add a PCSK9 inhibitor. These are like Prolulent, Repatha, and or Glycerin. Glycerin is a little harder to approve. There's not a lot of difference between Prilin and Repatha. Um, they're a twice a month injection, basically, and you do it twice a month. It goes in and it recycles LDL receptors. LDL receptors are these things that sit in your bloodstream looking for LDL. The LDL molecule walks by, it grabs it, pulls it in, and degrades it. It makes it so that the receptors don't get degraded as fast. Most LDL, most of the time when it grabs an LDL particle and comes into your liver, the liver degrades both. This makes it so the LDL receptors are recycled and not degraded. It works fantastic for this, actually. So that's what we do. Um, that's what PCSK9 inhibitors do. And glycerin is one that you have to do at an infusion center. You do it on, on day zero, then three months later, and then every day after that, every injection after that, it's every six months. The problem with PCSK9s is they're an injection and glycerin is every six months. Ultimately, the other two are basically twice a month and you do them at, at home by yourself. It's a lot easier to get those approved generally. The next step in, in this scenario would be called something called bempidoic acid. Bempidoic acid can be prescribed by itself, by itself as Nexlatol or with Zetia called Nexlazet. Bepidoic acid blocks cholesterol synthesis one step higher than statins, but it's very specific to the liver. Statin medications block cholesterol synthesis pretty much everywhere. Every cell in your body reduces cholesterol synthesis. When you put them on bepidoic acid, it only blocks it in the liver, so it's like very liver specific. So if some people are like, well, maybe I'm getting some brain fog, I don't know, etc., 
you could actually try this. Now it's very, very difficult to get approved, you know, more so than almost any other medication. Um, there have been outcome trials for all of these. None of these would have been approved. There's no outcome trials. There's out tons of outcome trials for statins. We'll get into those in a little bit, um, but there's outcome trials for all of these things. But bempedoic acid blocks it only in the liver. So hence you don't get that much of a reduction. You're getting like a 15 to 25% reduction, especially when combined with Zetia. This can be used in people who are statin intolerant um, or as an add-on, if say, let's say they're on a statin and Zetia and PCSK9 and their numbers are not coming down, this is someone you'd add bempedoic acid to. And insurance says in that scenario should have no problem uh, approving it. So let's talk side effects. Statins, obviously the most common side effect is uh, usually muscle aches. We call it statin-induced myalgias or SAMS, S-A-M-S. This is quite common. The way we test to see if this is true is we stop the statin, tell them to take two or three weeks off, see if the muscle aches go away. If they go away, restart the statin and see if they come back. A lot of patients will um, think they have muscle aches because they know that the medication is supposed to cause muscle aches. They call that the nocebo effect or the drusebo effect. You know you're supposed to get muscle aches, so you think you're getting muscle aches. Um, that's the most common thing. Now, do statins cause dementia or prevent it or what have you? Large meta-analyses have been done on veterans, 5 million people, 10 million people, what have you. I've talked about these on my blog. Go to dralnet slash blog or click on my links below. The statins have been actually associated with a low risk of all forms of dementia, even mild cognitive decline. You have a 22% reduction in dementia and a 32% reduction in Alzheimer's. So for whatever reason, they actually reduce dementia. Now, obviously, vascular dementia is plugged up arteries in your carotids, going up and stroking you out in your brain, or in the mi microvasculature in your brain, they call it microvascular angina, or microvascular dementia, where the little tiny arteries in your brains get plugged up with cholesterol and give you little infarcts or little strokes, and that causes dementia-like symptoms because you're dizzy, that part of your brain doesn't work anymore, you get forgetfulness or motor movements, what have you, because you're actually stroking out little tiny arteries and parts of your brain. So that's that. The PCSK9 inhibitors, these are the injectables. The only real side effect is injection site irritation. You know, you grab your skin, whatever, you inject it, you know, in your belly usually. There's a little bit of irritation around where you inject it, but that's pretty common. It's not common, but it's expected, I should say because you're injecting and poking something into your skin, so it's an expected um, reaction, um, which is not generally a problem. Um, the bempedoic acid, the only issue is it might raise your uric acid a little bit, so in some people we check that. My guess is down the road, we probably won't be checking that a lot. Some people ask, do statin medications raise your blood sugar or your A1C? Huge studies have been done on this, if you already have diabetes, you have the genetics for diabetes, and you are pre-diabetic, or you're already a diabetic, and you are put on a statin, you will have an A1C increase of about 0.1%. So like if you were 5.6, now you're 5.7, and you are, quote, pre-diabetic, you've been thrown into the pre-diabetic range. That does not mean that you were never diabetic, and you had no genes for it, and magically now we made you diabetic. Same thing if you're pre-diabetic. Let's say your A1C is 6.4, and you got pushed over 0.1 into 6.5, now you are quote unquote diabetic and they might put you on medication. So we have found in very large meta-analyses and studies that about 7% of people in the study, which is about the percentage of people in the population that have diabetes anyways, about 7% of people in the studies are newly started on diabetes medications. These are the people that are, you know, weren't, didn't know that they were diabetic, but now do know that they are diabetic and they're on medications for that. So, that's about all we have on statin. Now, all of these trials have had tremendous outcomes data. Statin medications, for example, especially with the more potent newer statins, they all reduce cardiovascular event rates, which means heart attacks, strokes, peripheral artery disease, you know, microvascular, vascular dementia, those kind of things. And they reduce cardiovascular event rates, which are the actual strokes, heart attacks, or you know, amputations, et cetera. They also reduce cardiovascular mortality, as you would expect, and they reduce all-cause mortality, um, as you would expect. Um, the PCSK9 inhibitors have also shown significant event rate reductions. We have not had these medications out long enough to have like long-term data on these. They've been around 11 and a half, maybe 12, 13 years now. There is a there is a um, mortality cardiovascular mortality benefit at least obviously they reduce non fatal MIs and fatal MIs. Bempedoic acid recently came out with the clear outcomes data. 
which have shown also reductions in cardiovascular event rates. Also, it's too new of a medication to have like mortality data yet. Maybe by the time you watch this, there will be. But that's kind of the summary of all the latest medications today. Now, when do you use phenofibrates or um, vasipa? Vasipa is EPA fish oil, EPA only fish oil. Phenofibrates would be used, and if you've max, it would be used in the case of somebody has elevated triglycerides, but you've maximized everything else. They're already on a statin, they're already on Zetia, they're already on whatever. Most people with high triglycerides, though, it, let's, we're assuming these are people under 500, so 499 or lower. Most people with high triglycerides, usually their diabetes is just not well controlled. Their diabetes is out of control, their A1C is too high, maximize their diabetes control. Get them on the GLP-1s, SGLT, uh, SGLT-2s, which are like your Jardians and Farsiga, um, Invokana. Get them on the Ozempics, the Manjaros, the Trulicities, the Saxendas, uh, Bayetta, Bidurion, you know, that whole class, Victoza, that whole class of medications. Get them on metformin. Intensify their diabetes treatment. Most of those patients, if you treat their diabetes better and get them under better control, you'll notice their triglycerides come way, way down. Sure, you can make them look prettier with phenofibrates and or vasipa, but you're not gonna have as much of an impact as if you control their diabetes. Another reason why people may have high triglycerides would be they have some underlying you know, genetic kind of triglyceridemia, but they're alcoholic, they have kidney disease, things like that. Alcoholism for sure does it. Kidney disease, not as much, but it can. But this is all people under 500. If you are in the thousands, you have something called familial family genetic hypertriglyceridemia. Those people need to be pretty much treated the same exact way with the statins, with everything. Treat their diabetes, stop drinking, stop everything. And then you can add on the phenofibrates and the uh, vasipa if they're still not down. A lot of times I get sent patients whose triglycerides are a little bit elevated and their cholesterol is still elevated and they're not, and they're put on phenofibrate. Like, why are you on this phenofibrate? You still have, you're on a baby dose of a stat and you're not even on Zetia. You're not maximized on anything. Your cholesterol, your blood, your um, diabetes is way out of control. But why are we adding phenofibrate? Like get their diabetes under control, maximize their statin therapy, get that all under control first, and then you can add a phenofibrate later. And I can tell you, maybe only 5% of patients will ever need a phenofibrate or uh, vasipa EPA type fish oil. So please remember it in this order. You want to go statin, you want to go Zetia. They're cheap, generic, the most potent, the most historic. They've been around the most, have the most outcomes data. Then you want to go PCSK9 inhibitors. Then you want to go bempedoic acid. Then you want to go phenofibrate. And then if you need to, you could go for SEPA or this EPA uh, fish oil, which should be rare. But if you're getting that deep into the algorithm, they should be seeing a cardiologist and or a lipidologist, not you if you're in just generally in primary care. So if you like this kind of stuff, follow me for more. I would love to have you as a follower. Leave some comments. I answer all my comments. Um, leave some comments, ask some questions, go to my blog. My blog has tons and tons of research articles, stuff just like this. Um, but definitely share this with all of your friends. And I look to see you in the next episode.